right, good morning and thank you all for coming. It's kind of like, can we get back to politics or epidemiology? So let's do it. I'm gonna talk about uh, honest evidence for incidents. You go to a doctor, you ask the doctor, what are the side effects of this drug? Odds are your doctor has a pretty good idea of the important side effects that we know about. Then you ask your doctor, well, how often, what's my risk? How often does that happen? And the answer will be something like, well, you know, I don't see it that much, I'm not that worried about it. You wanna know what's the number or where do you get that from? And generally, they don't have a very good answer. And even if they go on the internet and try to look it up somewhere, for the vast majority of side effects for that drug, uh, there's no evidence for it. And even for the ones uh, for which there is some evidence, it's actually very confusing and I'll be showing that in a little bit. So the idea is why don't we start simple? Do clinical characterization, as Odyssey call, calls it, that is non-causal, just tally how often uh, a condition occurs during a cohort. For example, how often there's a side effect after you start a drug. Why, why do we want to start so simple here? Well, if the incidence is low, then I don't need to worry about it. I don't have to worry about what the cause, if I get it right, if it's low and I've gotten the, the estimate right, then I don't care if it's causal because it's not going to happen because the probability is low. If the incidence is high, I don't know if the drug caused it the way for what I'm going to be discussing for the next uh, few minutes. Uh, but actually, I still know I need to look out for it. If I'm starting a, a drug for depression and the risk of suicide is 30% after it, whether the drug caused it or not, I'm going to want to know that risk as a doctor and, and worry about that for my patient. Another reason to do the simple one first is that I can actually execute the all by all, that is every drug, every side effect. Not every side effect, every condition. And that's what we've done and I'll be showing later on. Also, it's fewer assumptions. When I give you a number, here's the incidence after you, when you start a drug, here's the incidence of this condition, you understand what I'm expressing to you. There are no assumptions, there are no statistical models, I'm just counting something. So it's easy to grasp, but it's less simple than it sounds. And the truth is it's quite complicated as I'll be explaining in a moment. And so let's get this one right first before we get to the more complicated causal ones. So at the end of this, you'll be able to answer for any drug and any side effect. When I start this drug, what is the chance I'll experience a condition in the next year? So what are we talking about here? So on the far left and the far right are the observation period. You have a person in a database and they're observed in that database from the black arrow to the black arrow. Then within that time of observation, they enter a cohort. That's the cohort entry to the cohort exit in blue. That cohort, in a, most of my examples, will be something like starting a drug for the first time, and the cohort lasts as long as you're on the drug. Then there's some time at risk where I'm worried about whether a condition occurs, say a side effect, or a positive condition, maybe one of the purposes of giving you the drug. And then there's some outcome I'm interested in, that's the outcome occurrence. If it occurs in the time at risk, then I count it. I can measure the proportion. So two metrics I'm gonna show, one is proportion, which in the numerator will be the number of persons in the, my cohort who experience that outcome during the time at risk, divided by the total number of people who are at, at risk in the cohort. The other choice is an incidence rate, which is the same numerator, how many experience the outcome, divided by, in this case, the number of person years or person days that the person is at risk. So I can do a rate or a proportion. So let me just go a little bit, dive a little bit deeper on what we are and what we aren't doing. On the far left is in dark blue is the baseline risk if you never took a drug. Now these are all made up numbers I'm showing you. For warf the risk of stroke off warfarin and anticoagulant. So that's the baseline risk around 20%. If I take warfarin, it might hurt me by causing a hemorrhagic stroke, so that's in red, or it may help me by averting an embolus and that's shown in green. I put those two together, all the bad and the good news, and I get the attributable effect of warfarin. In this case, it's a benefit, a net benefit. And what I observe in my database is in light blue on the far right, uh, the net uh, rate of stroke while on warfarin. So that's the thing I'm gonna observe. If I now, again, this is made up, not what really happens in practice. I show warfarin again on the left, on the right I show aspirin. Here, the net benefit of aspirin, it also can cause bleeding, it also can avert emboli. So the net benefit of aspirin is smaller than warfarin, yet because the initial risk of stroke in that cohort is lower, the final incidence is lower on aspirin. 
So I want to know, should I take warfarin or aspirin? The way to answer is not necessarily to look at the incidence of stroke on the two drugs, because aspirin looks better, but it looks better because the initial risk was lower to begin with. It was given in a lower risk group. However, those two numbers are still useful on the right. For example, if one of them was a zero, if that light blue was in zero, then I'd know there's no risk and that I'd be safe. And um, also, I know that even after taking warfarin, I still have to watch out for stroke in patients. So there's a zillion, uh, there are many different things uh, that cause, re that uh, make this complicated, and I'll go through them one at a time. How do you pick the target cohort, that is, say, in this case, the drug? Should it be new users of the drug, using the drug for the first time? Just to pick one concrete example, if I pick new users of drug, how far do I look back to make sure it's new? If I look back just one day, then they may have had the drug a week ago and I would have missed that, so it's not really a new drug. If I look back 30 years, then I'm not gonna get any 20-year-olds in my cohort. So I have to make some choices and, and maybe make a complicated algorithm to figure out what's a new user of a drug. How about the outcome? Uh, should it be the first time I ever ex experienced that outcome in my life? Should it be the first time since the drug was prescribed? Or just should I count every occurrence as another event? I might have a different uh, opinion, whether it's a heart attack, which I may want to count more of them, or diabetes, where once you start it, you probably uh, stay on the diabetes. Another thing you can ask is, when I, uh, what's the sensitivity and specificity of, of my definition of the outcome? If I pick any ICD-9 code for a diagnosis, I'll get a lot of them. But if I ensure, say, for GI gastrointestinal bleed, make sure it's a hospitalization for GI bleed, then I'm more specific. I make sure it's a serious bleed, but I'm gonna miss some bleeding events. What, which time at risk should I use? 30 days, shown first, a year is the second one, while they're on the drug, or for as long as they're in my database once they start the drug, whether they stop it or not. So I have different choices of time at risk. And then once we pick a time at risk, what, if, what about people who leave the cohort, that is leave my database halfway through their time at risk? Time at risk is a year, they leave the database at six months. Then I don't know what happens for the last six months. Should I count everyone who entered the cohort? If I do, then I'm guaranteed to do an underestimate. I have a lower bound in the incidence rate. If I do the opposite and only include people that make it all the way through the cohort, then I likely have an upper bound. Um, if the um, rate of side effects is roughly constant, then it will be an upper bound. And in fact, if you do both of them, the answer will be about halfway in between if the risk is constant. What metric should I report? I already mentioned proportion and rate. Do I put 95% confidence intervals around it? What happens in the literature is you give a sampling error variation, which is, as we use databases that have 100 million people, that's vanishingly small. Certainly the uncertainty in my estimates are larger than some very, very tiny confidence interval just because there are a lot of patients. So what we do is, <clears throat> for now, is we're characterizing it by doing it in many databases and giving you a range from the lowest to the highest, and that is probably a better estimate of uncertainty than anything that you'll get by doing sampling error in the literature. What data should be used? This again comes back to using the data in the network and studying the heterogeneity across the data. It's not bad news that the Medicare database is mostly old people, older generation, because then I can see what happens there. I can see in a different database what happens with a younger population, and I can start to understand the, uh, the differences between them. And you can actually come up with a framework for a hierarchy of uncertainty that I won't go through now, but there are some forms of uncertainty that I want to know about, that is biological differences between people and environmental differences, and there's some I'm trying to get rid of, like uh, ETL, software errors. And sampling error becomes vanishingly small, as I already said. So what's the, co the problem with current practice? Well, number one, most things don't have any evidence whatsoever. But for the things that do, we identified a number of problems and they are enumerated here. By the way, the light gray is there for you not to read. <laughs> it's on the screen because when you download my slide deck, you will be able to read what I was saying without having to read it right now. So I'm trying to go through the talk more quickly. Uh, but then when you download the thing, often you get one of these slide decks, you saw the talk and now it's incomprehensible because there's no information behind it. So I'm giving you the information to read later on. I'm gonna actually go through each of these points with, with uh, visual examples, so that's why I'm not gonna go through it now. 
How can Odyssey help? Well, first, we can develop the standardized framework for how should one do incidence generation and dissemination. And then we're going to look at the network and, first of all, verify that that's a reasonable framework. Second, fill in the gaps where there's no evidence. And third, where there is evidence, see if we can verify it and uh, help it do a better job at uncovering uncertainty. So what we know is that ACE inhibitors cause angioedema and we worry about it. Um, what we want to know, well, the first thing we're doing in red is what we're doing here today, is the incidence of angioedema after people taking ACE inhibitors without knowing whether the ACE inhibitor caused it. The next step, not shown today, is population level effect estimation, that is, what's the attributable risk? And the third one is patient level prediction, and I'm going to touch on that uh, a little bit on a later slide. So let's take a drug like lisinopril, and let's go to the uh, drug label. And here we see angioedema, and they describe angioedema giving a risk, but they're not telling you how often it happens. So when the patient asks, how often does it happen, if you go to the drug label, you say, I don't know. It appears to happen. Let's go to the drug label for the generic form. Ah, they do have a number, 0.1%. So that's great. So 0.1% of what to do what? First of all, they don't tell you if it's a rate of proportion, and it turns out they report rates as percents as well. You'd think that proportions would be percents, but actually they report rates as proportions also. So you don't know if it's a rate of proportion. You don't know if the time at risk was 30 days or a year. Um, you don't know the definitions of the outcomes or the cohorts. So you have virtually no information, and it's an arbitrary number. It just says, well, it sounds pretty small, but angioedema is pretty serious, so even small is important. What's the literature say? Well, let's see three studies, and they give a rate of uh, 1.7 per thousand person years, 2.8, 4.3. That's the bottom of each of their ranges or confidence intervals. Well, the first thing you notice they give in confidence intervals. Well, thank you for calculating that, but you'll notice that the three of them have no overlap. So they three officially contradict each other. And that's because they're just measuring sampling variance, not the all the different sources of uncertainty or variance, including differences in population, like the first one's the VA, so it's probably a different population. But the next two should have been overlapping a little more than that. They're assuming that the only source of uncertainty is random error. What do, what do uh, clinicians do? So they can go to a web-based resource like UpToDate and look it up. Here we see it says 0.1 to 0.7%. Well, that's pretty good, and if you look at the graph, it actually overlaps the three studies. So they've gone to the literature, looked these things up, and that's actually not a bad range to put on the, so that was heartening to see. So let's apply this to the Odyssey network. You see the target cohort is lisinopril, the outcome is angioedema, the time at risk I'm doing one year. Um, I'm actually, for inclusion criteria, the there's two kinds of triangles, one pointing up, one pointing down for each database. One of them is including everyone who made it all the way through the time at risk window, and the other is including everyone who entered the time at risk window, which should be bookending the true rate. Uh, as you can see that the rate is from 0.1 to point, uh, the proportion is 0.1 to 0.8%. If we map this, you see the original, the product label said 0.1, up to date said 0.1 to 0.7. Those three studies were in the range of up to date. And Odyssey confirms the up to date uh, estimate as 0.1 to 0.8. Shown there are not only, uh, not only the triangles, uh, but also squares and diamonds. So I did it both as a rate, or Patrick did it both as a rate and as a, and, and as a proportion to show that whether I did it one way or the other, they both cover the range fairly well. Let's go to a different uh, side effect, lisinopril. And cough, another one that is well known, ACE inhibitors cause coughs. So the drug label says 2.5%. Uh, this one gives you an attributable risk. So this is the cough that's caused by the drug. I'd actually like to know the, both the absolute rate and the attributable rate, but OK. So that's 2.5%. So let's go to up to date, and it says 5 to 20%. So it doesn't overlap the first one. Maybe 5 to 25% is the absolute risk, not the attributable risk, but it's likely that that other thing was an un underestimate what's on the drug label. They cite a meta-analysis which noted about 10% rate, and 4% of patients who had, a, had the drug had a cough so severe they were taken off the drug. So 4% is significantly higher than the 2% we saw before. <clears throat> 
we go to the literature, this study by uh, Bangalore uh, says 11%, so not too far off from that other 10% rate. And this is for enalapril, and that's almost 10 times higher than the drug label. And the times you take it off the drug is 2.5%, which is 20 times higher than the drug label says. We go to Odyssey and we get a range of 3 to 14%. So remember, up to date said 5 to 20. We're getting 3 to 14. That meta-analysis I just showed said 9 to 13. So they're all agreeing with each other fairly well. So now let's go to sertraline and looking at suicidal ideation, suicide thoughts and behavior. Uh, as you start reading, you see there's maybe an increased risk. You may have read about this in young people, although a decreased risk in older people. And they show you attributable risk of how many cases. So in this per thousand patients treated, 14 additional cases in the youngest, six uh, fewer cases in the oldest. One thing I want to point out is I actually want to know the absolute risk also because I do want to know, um, just because I'm giving a drug, I wanted to know what the baseline risk is when I'm actually treating a patient. But moving on from that, uh, I go to the literature, I see this study which says um, 400 out of 100,000 or 0.4% uh, where the um, time at risk uh, was 8 to 10 weeks. And they say that's kind of short for this kind of study. That's what we found in the literature, so we couldn't fix it. So let's just say, I don't know, maybe five times as much if we were to do a more reasonable one. So that's their estimate of what happens, of what would happen. So we're saying in Odyssey, well, maybe you're right and maybe you're wrong. Why don't we just measure it? So first, let me show you the 30-day suicide ideation and suicide risk. And we get a number of 0.06 to 0.99, which does cover the 0.38 estimate. Now, if I do the two risk windows, first 30-day and then one year, you can see that it, that it actually increases it by about a factor of four. So if I increase my risk window, I go up. So their estimate of five times bigger is actually pretty good. The difference is they asserted it and we measured it. So now looks like look at GI bleeding in the setting of sertraline. This one says there may be an increased risk. Well, that's not uh, telling me enough. This one tells me an odds ratio. Well, an odds ratio is interesting if I'm trying to tell causality, does the drug cause it? But if I want to know what to tell the patient, um, this is not enough because I need to know the absolute risk to calculate how much this odds ratio causes extra effect. Again, we measure it, and we find 0.2% to 2% um, if we take a strict diet definition of GI bleed. Now I'm going to go, if I, if I ensure that, the, that, it, that there has to involve a hospitalization, then I get a 0 to 2%. If I say it could be any kind of GI bleed that I was seen as an outpatient, then I get uh, 0.2 to 5%, so about doubles the risk if I'm a little more lax in my definition. Again, so in each of these examples, I'm showing you different ways that you can make the thing go up or make the thing go down depending on your exact definition. Our tendency is to run them all and show the user here is, now that's hard for a patient to understand, but to someone who's understanding the evidence, to give you all the different parts and then you can judge how to apply the information. Now I'm going to do another one for sexual dysfunction. Here they actually show both the absolute and the attributable risk. 14 and 6% for different forms of it um, is the total risk, with the placebo being 1%, so the attributable risk being 1 minus those two numbers. But the package insert, <clears throat> the drug label says, probably higher than is actually reported, because they admit that sexual dysfunction is not going to be reported that frequently. If you go to up to date, they say the, rage, the actual rate is probably 15 to 80%. So one in six to uh, one in seven to six in seven rate, which is a pretty wide range, which basically says it's not zero and it's not everyone, but it's anywhere in between. So now let's go to Odyssey, and we picked this example on purpose. Well, I'll go into that a little bit. Odyssey is shown here. We see good consistency, and the rate is 0.04 percent to one percent. So that's a lot lower than 15 to 80 percent. So why did we pick this example? We picked this example because we wanted an example that didn't work, where we knew that there was going to be bias, and that people were going to underreport, and even when they reported it, was it going to be coded in the billing codes? And you can see there's that it's consistent across the databases, and yet it's too low. So this won't always work. 
So we developed a framework for clinical characterization of outcome evidence. And that framework meaning, and we're not done with it yet, but uh, the, all the different choices you have and what are the consequences of picking one choice over another. That's what I mean by a framework. We then demonstrate its reliability across several examples, but then we highlight at the end that, in fact, as with all observational evidence, we can't assure uh, that the reliable results or actually accurate results depending on the context. <clears throat> so if you go and you look at this and the rate is high, why might, why might it be high? Well, first of all, realize that uh, the rate is going to be high for the indication for the drug, right? The reason you took the drug is going to be high on the list. Now, you'd think that we got rid of those because we're only looking at things that occur after you start the drug. But first of all, the, the, the side effect may be common in the underlying population without the drug. The indication may not be the, the, in, the indication for the thing may be the risk of a disease rather than the disease itself. Like it might be risk of heart attack rather than heart attack. So even though you take the drug, you may still get a heart attack despite it. So that could make it go high. Things associated with the indication <coughs> and reverse timing, like often in the electronic health record, the drug, the prescription and the diagnosis may flip and you may think the diagnosis occurred after the drug when it actually came before it. Or it could be what we're really looking for, attributable risk, that is, that the drug caused that thing. If the rate is low and accurate and the side effect is not serious, then the side effect may not be important, but the current version is only based on billing codes, so you're only going to get side effects that are reported and are worthy of billing. Uh, so that's the caveat. So I would say that you have to read it and then interpret it. We don't use this for discovering side effects. This is given that you know what side effect you're interested in, you can go and look it up. So just to use an example from New York Presbyterian Columbia's database, Simvastatin, I sorted them by the top 1,000, the top things in order of descending order of how often these conditions happen. And the first 1,000 <clears throat> weren't interesting. But the good news was when I finally got to side effects I cared about, like in Simvastatin rhabdomyolysis, the rate was stunningly accurate compared to what's in the literature for the ones that are in the literature. So what were those first thousand? It was things like hypercholesterolemia, that is the indication for the drug, and things associated with it. And since we're using all different forms, we're literally doing all conditions at all granularities, there are about 100 words for, not words for, but different forms of hypercholesterolemia, all of which can be elevated. And that's why there were so many terms before it. So you can't go through a list and saying which ones are the important ones. You have to know which ones to look for. But just looking at it for myself, when I start a drug, I'm probably going to go on the database and look up for things that I care about, say things that are on the package insert, and just see what the rate was in Odyssey and draw my own conclusions. Okay, so let's, uh, so this is on the internet. I'm not telling you the <laughs> URL until the demo is over. Because what went wrong this morning is that we were over using our API for the vocabulary. So I'm going to type in lisinopril and cough. scroll. Pick a, more, a less kind. Angioedema I thought was pretty uncommon. Pick a, a side effect that has fewer synonyms. Leave it blank. Thank you. If I leave it blank, it goes to the package, the, the package label. So I said that I don't want to get a thousand things. So what I've done is I uh, if I don't, what I want you to do is put in a drug and a side effect, so you're picking what to look at. If you don't put anything for the side effect, what will happen is it'll say, well, what are the things that are on the maker's package label, because those are the things that are likely to be side effect-like. And that's what I've done, and then it'll bring them up, and I can load more, load more. But right here, I can see angioedema, which I was trying to get to before. And then it'll show what would have shown if I had been able to do cough. So we see angioedema in the setting of lisinopril, has a rate of 0.001 to 0.008% uh, proportion. That's not a percent, that's a proportion. It's graphed there. We have to think about the, we're thinking about the axes and how to do that. Um, because, I'm pointing at the screen, sorry. Uh, we don't want the axes to change their definition over time because people may think it's big when it's actually small. So we're working out that in the log scale, most people can't uh, process. Below it, what you'll see is all our databases and the actual rates shown for that disease. And then what we do is both for patients for the cohort where we ensure that person has the full time at risk 
and ones that are a partial time at risk. So you can go in and on my Mac, I can get and just scroll down and get the whatever side effects I want. So some observations. So you can after this, and when the, we, that wasn't a bug, that's just how to use this, use, use the, this laptop for me. The, uh, you can type in any drug and any side effect and see what the Odyssey database shows for you. Uncertainty assessment is the linchpin of reproducibility and honest evidence. That's the key thing to solve in any of these problems. It's not just sampling variation, it's time to start pre stop pretending that that's what we need to show in our studies. Showing a confidence interval that's minuscule is just not useful. And we need to stop saying, well, it's just an observational study, so we don't need to trust it. We need to make our observational studies reliable and put in the right amount of uncertainty so when we give a result, it's believable. Even if the confidence interval is very wide, at least we're being honest about it. We want to exploit the network to learn about uncertainty, although as you've seen, in the example of um, uh, sexual dysfunction that there was bias that was replicated across sites. So we want to learn to model full uncertainty. We like to pull in the knowledge basically if there is literature on it, we want to pull that onto the same screen that we're showing the Odyssey evidence and you can see if there's a discrepancy which would cause, um, a, uh, cause some skepticism about the result. So we want to look at other target populations restricted to different treatments, stratified by age and gender. And we want to look at patient level prediction that is transitioning from what's the risk in everyone to what's the risk in individuals. And you'll see that more in Jenna's talk in a little while. So this is just a proof of concept. Um, we need your help. First of all, if you have data, you can run the all by all incidence analysis for us and donate those answers back to this so they will show up on that screen so we get a broader, uh, broader range of the population and your population will be included in those estimates. If you're a methods researcher, um, we could use your help in estimating the uncertainty range. What's the best way to do that beyond just doing a simple range? If we have a thousand databases in there, we don't want to do the range anymore. We could do the interquartile range. It'll be too wide. But estimating a good model for it would be a good thing. If you're an open source developer, build a better user interface to this database. The purpose of our user interface is not to access by doctors and patients, just to demonstrate it so that other people will take the database and build a user interface and incorporate it into their systems. I want to acknowledge the Jane Kaskinis and Ted Giovannis Foundation for Health and Policy for funding this work, and Ted's in the back of the room. You can thank him. Thank you, Ted. and the National Library of Medicine also contributed to this work. Thanks to the Odyssey collaborators, this was just a team effort. This was a team effort, I'm just a presenter who was elected to come up here. The Columbia team for putting together the user interface on a very short notice, and the Odyssey infrastructure uh, that runs behind this thing. And that's it, thank you very much. <laughs>